Hi, I'm Cheryl Dunier, the director and um, star of the film The Watermelon Woman. It won the Teddy in uh, 1996, which is about 20 years ago. Um, and I was there to celebrate that, and I'm going to be there again to celebrate the Teddy turning 30 and the Watermelon Woman turning 20. Um, we're a good pairing. So happy birthday, and I am very much looking forward to it. And, you know, Teddy, rock on. Hello, Cheryl. How are you doing? Hi, I'm great, Philip. Thank you. <laughs> I'm here in California, which actually it's a little bit cold um, in, in Northern California, but not as cold as it is, I'm sure, in Berlin. Well, your movie, Watermelon Woman, <clears throat> I mean, it won the Teddy Award in 1996, so that's 20 years ago. It was the 10th Teddy Award. And, um, well, so the movie is going to be in the retro this year, which is great. So we all will have the chance to watch this movie again at the festival. And, well, it's a movie about a woman who does a research project on black women in American movies. And I would like to ask you, how did you come up with this topic? Why, why did you want to make this movie? Yes, um, I came up with the idea of The Watermelon Woman. Um, during, after I graduated from Rutgers University where I went to graduate school. And I started to research um, black lesbian film history. And there is none. Uh, there's a few makers, but there is no sort of images. So I, I pulled it apart. I said, well, let me just look up sort of what, it, what black lesbians look like in Hollywood and let me look like uh, what black lesbian life looked like. And there were two separate archives. The black lesbian imagery um, in Hollywood, was there was none. Um, and then the black images of women in history, there was some. So I said, well, if, I wanna, if I'm going to wait and, and really find information that's not going to be there because these lives weren't recorded or considered valued, I'm going to have to make this up. So why don't I make a film about myself making this up? Um, and one of my influences in uh, filmmaking, um, uh, David Holtzman's Diary, Diary by Jim McBride is one of the films. Um, also a German film, and I don't remember the director's name, but Nasty Girl, who also looks up her history and sort of makes up interesting um, archival footage with uh, rear projection. Um, so, you know, there were models of filmmakers who were playing this, like, fiction, non-fiction line, and I thought, why not? This is a perfect opportunity for me to um, do what I was practicing in my short filmmaking. I made a film that was in Berlin, uh, a short film called Greetings from Africa that came to Berlin prior to The Watermelon Woman, where I do a talking head, which I call the Dunye Mentory, my last name. <laughs> um, and I just, you know, expounded on that and made it into a bigger and longer film. So it came from a lot of different places, form-wise, content-wise, but knowing that I would be the only physical body to play Cheryl searching for herself in a film. Well, you said that there was no black lesbian film history. Would you say that has changed? Is there a black lesbian film history now? Um, black lesbian film history today is, you know, hasn't expanded as much as we would say, uh, or kept up with sort of new queer cinema, right? I think new queer cinema has evolved to the point where we have a wonderful maker, uh, director like Todd Haynes, who was birthed around the same time as I was, um, who now has this big, you know, Oscar, you know, contending hit called Carol with, you know, actors and, you know, getting a lot of support. But all the films that kind of came out around that time with new queer cinema, even the fabulous Paris is Burning with, with, um, Jenny Livingston, you know, where did, what happened to her career and what happened to those bodies in that film? So um, where you saw The Watermelon Woman, which, you know, came a little bit later than 91 when New Queer Cinema was, was birthed, all of, you know, my, my colleagues and all this sort of short film and imagery that was happening in the sort of birth of New Queer Cinema, none of it evolved. Um, about 10 years after The Watermelon Woman, we do get a, a young, wonderful maker named Dee Reese who made the film Pariah. Um, we have a few other films by a few other folks, but 
for the most part, you're looking at in the feature world, and I would not say in the doc world. And in the doc world, it's still, you know, there's just not a lot of work that's being supported I would, and, 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 and shown in those venues where we would, you know, at film festivals that are non-LGBT film festivals or at theaters where, um, you know, they have exhibition and, 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 and people can go and see these things. We do see them at local and lesbian and gay film festivals on that level, but in the sort of national and international sense, we're not seeing that work, nor is that work supported. And I must be very clear that Hollywood does not want it, Indywood does not want it, um, and, you know, there are a few moves in global production that do allow it, and I would say to come out in documentary, but no, we, we don't have a, a plethora of, of films made by and about black, queer, lesbian, whatever you want to say, lives. We do have images. Now, imagery is a different thing. Um, orange is the new black, you know, all these sort of characters that are dropped in as sort of the, you know, magical Negro, as I would say, in, in these films. So they do appear, they, they don't have much of a storyline, but it does show diversity in, 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 in representation, but not in front and, and behind the camera is it balanced. Mm -hmm. Well, you were talking about support and the lack of support. Well, I read that <clears throat> after you shot your movie and you got some, some statal funding for it, politicians said that there was the serious possibility that taxpayer money is being used to fund the production and distribution of patently offensive and possibly pornographic movies. Um, yes. Well, would you, would you say that this is still something that is happening nowadays, that from official side those people are still, well, banning movies like Watermelon Woman or trying to ban those or trying to cut off statal fundings? Well, this is a grave situation in the states that's different than sort of European filmmaking where there is state support for um, diversity in filmmaking um, for every voice and every kind of community you can apply for government funds to make films. We don't have government funds. We have local state funds, but the fund that I got, which was the National Endowment of the Arts Individual Artist Grant, the Watermelon Woman basically was the project that sort of brought, you know, knocked out that funding round. Um, this was in, you know, 1996. Um, we're looking at a, uh, you know, very imbalanced time and, and a very, it was a very weird time around the National Endowment of the Arts, support of the arts. There was, you know, Serrano and other artists and other, you know, um, uh, modes of, of making work were being attacked. And, and so when the Watermelon Woman came up, it was low-hanging fruits for the Republicans and, and those who wanted to bring down the National Endowment of the Arts, giving to individuals to make their expression. It was it was low-hanging fruit to to de, you know to knock out that funding round. Now, there is funding for larger organizations, but do those organizations support this sort of filmmaking? No, uh, I would say not. You know, uh, maybe on a small state level. So that's what's really different. Is like. No, you can't turn to the government and say, hey, I have an idea about, um, you know, or hey, I'm, I'm a budding, you know, queer woman of color filmmaker, support me. Now we're looking at states, we're looking at donations, um, and that's pretty hard. It's a difficult time um, in media where, you know, uh, there's so many forms of media and so many ways uh, uh, to support media that um, feature filmmaking, and I I'm just going to continue with that, is, is really not being supported. Um, in the narrative side um, for queer women of color. Mm -hmm. Well, aside from, from film history and the visibility in film history, how would you describe the situation of women of color, especially queer women of color, in the time when you shot the movie? Right. Um, I would say the situation for queer women of color when I was making the film, um, we were sort of, in America, we were coming out of this thing called the culture wars. So this was a time where sort of aid activism, ACT UP, there was a lot of visibility, there was a lot of anger and activism around making images. And so that's where the, the birth of new queer cinema came from. So we, we, we were seeing sort of the first films of, of every sort of community, the first, you know, um, African-American film, the first, you know, Asian-American uh, woman uh, uh, film, uh, lesbian film, you know, all these sort of first, the first gay male film. So the 90s was filled with this, you know, a variety of first images in independent filmmaking. So I feel that the 90s was a much more 
conscious and vital time. I mean, we have to look again at what was going on politically in America. You know, it's the Clinton era. There was a little bit more softness um, in the sense of, you know, what's going on. And maybe that we're starting to see, you know, these issues come up again now with, you know, uh, having Obama have been in office for quite some time, not necessarily saying that the same support is there, but we are seeing a sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a few more things squeaking through. Uh, but again, it's not the, the plethora of, you know, work that um, other identities experience, you know, and I must say that it's, um, the 90s was a, a vital time, a lot of um, work in doc and in narrative and more in shorts were sort of bubbling up and, and, and filling our film festivals. Mm -hmm. um, well, you already said, or you already drew parallels to, to nowadays. Well, how would you say that the situation changed? And would you say that Obama or, well, the, the election of a president of color actually had a significant say in this change? Did that change something? Um, I think the election of you know, the election for diversity, I wouldn't necessarily say it, it was because he was, you know, an African-American president, but the, the, the election that we are, you know, believing in, in something that what America's concept of the melting pot and, and this diverse pool, it, it, it worked. So we we're actually able to see, you know, during his, his, his tenure, um, gay marriage, all these sort of things that we believed in and, you know, uh, that we wanted and hoped for, you know, things changing around um, drugs and medication, you know, um, you know, a, a lot of different structures were, were um, changing or being allowed to be talked about. Now, you know, for them to be eradicated, for them to be, you know, fully supported, you know, there are other mechanisms that are in place that, you know, conservatives are just knocking and chipping away at these, you know, in, in Congress. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a different movement when it, when it comes from above. And, and I think that's what's way different about um, American queer cinema and, say, European queer cinema. Though they're similar. I mean, once you get to the screen, you do. Um, but the support mechanisms that are in the states um, you know, we, we get what we ask for, so we do get imagery, but where that comes from is in, in a variety of different places. I think the internet and technology being, you know, now into a handheld device um, allowed for films like Tangerine to be happen, happen and, uh, you know, about trans of color, um, shot on an iPhone, um, taking over Sundance, you know, up for Oscars and this and that. That wouldn't have happened back in the 90s. So technology, um, um, I also do think that um, the, the communities have changed from uh, physical communities to internet communities. Um, you know, so social media has really had an effect on who makes work and how it's made and, and who the consumers are. So we can see that happening, but we definitely aren't going to see, I think, um, you know, from above our states here, at least in America, really sort of embrace uh, what's, you know, we need more queer of color films, mm. let's support them, you know, we're not, that's not going to happen in, in America. Well, if, if I get you right, <clears throat> well, I have the feeling that there is a big discrepancy, like, that you on the one hand say that there is sort of a change from above, and at the same time it is possible for a lot of people to shoot movies, especially with the new technology, social media, but at the same time it sounds like as if the grassroots movement was more vital, more active in the 90s than it is nowadays. Yes, uh, yes, I, I would say that is true. But then you get to the, the, the guard that I call like Hollywood, you know, this guard that's Indiewood, you know, the Sundance Film Festival, for what it's worth, we love Sundance, but it does put a stamp, and if you don't reach a sort of Sundance standard of filmmaking or you're able to walk through the sort of, you know, the Hollywood you know, arches of filmmaking, your films are, you know, on a, another tip, you know, and it's not saying that they're not consumed, but they're not given that sort of, you know, this is what we call cinema, where, you know, the backing by independent production companies, studios, or, you know, a, a other vehicles that would allow um, visibility to be, you know, not a viral thing, but, you know, a, a thing.
something that is supported at, you know, independent cinema houses, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, what is cinema? I mean, I think it's evolving, and I think it's, you know, a, a, a medium uh, that's evolving, and, and new voices are getting in there, but this sort of value system of what is, you know, high art, low art, I mean, I think that's really, you know, um, to play here uh, with why there are not more images by certain communities. Mm -hmm. um, well, looking back at the, at the film history and also at independent cinema, new queer cinema, um, you said, and I hope I quote you right, that it's going to take more than just my film for that picture to be corrected, the picture of women of color in film history. Now, looking back 20 years later, how would you place your movie in queer film history or in film history in general? Right. Um, I think I would place the woman, Watermelon Woman as a, you know, a film of sort of uh, a groundbreaking film, um, a film that crossed the line from just being a film to being something more than just a film, just being, you know, I think there's cinema that just could be entertaining. You know, there's a lot of happy-go-lucky queer films by any kind of community, but a queer film that's trying to work culturally and politically and, um, you know, and, and also involve the other arts. So working with Zoe Leonard to make those pictures, including Toshi Reagan, Brian Freeman, Camille Paglia, Sarah Shulman, you know, all these sort of cultural producers in the film. I don't think people are completely doing that, you know. I mean, I think that, so I, I think the Watermelon Woman still is in this space where, um, uh, you know, not a lot of people care enough to do that in, in film. Yeah, you know, I gotta get stars, I gotta create box office, but, you know, or I, we could find somebody that looks like that cultural producer and, and write a character in. And I'm just talking about narrative film. I'm not talking about documentary. I'm not talking about you know other forms of media. I'm talking about narrative um, feature production. I think you know people don't value it, um, and you know, they value it in a different way. So I think the Watermelon Woman still is like up here. It, it, you know, it, one of my um, you know uh, mentors when he was alive um, was Marlon Riggs, um, who did you know. A different kind of work, but definitely was was there about like let's put our community in our work. We are a value. Let's let's see the voices. Let's you know work with each other. And and so Marlon's you know sort of type of filmmaking. I still do that today. I mean, I made The Owls. I made you know Mommy's Coming. I mean, I I really do believe that we need to see our community and and cultural producers in culture and in in, in film. So um, I, I I do think. Watermelon Woman sort of stands out um, from all sort of queer film production to date because of its use of that. Well, and because of those things, it actually won the Teddy Awards. And, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, well, I would also like to ask you, would you say that the Teddy Award had an influence on the prominence of the movie? You know, I would say yes. I mean, I think winning the Teddy was the the most, you know, exciting thing for, you know, a, a young up and coming filmmaker who was doing it on the, their own, regardless of, you know, whatever the film was about. But definitely the, the Watermelon Woman um, gained a lot of mileage, a lot of cred. It, it, it showed in, you know, once you get a stamp from a major film festival, you show in, 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 in major film festivals that aren't even lesbian and gay. So it did play, you know, around the world, got, you know, distribution in many different languages. Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like it allowed me to move in ways and spaces within, you know, the cinema world that I, I would not have been able to. And it definitely had a, a positive impact on, on who I was as a, a filmmaker. Mm. So you would also say it had a personal influence on you? Yes, it did. It, 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 I think it really, um, the making of the Watermelon Woman, the Watermelon Women, the Teddy Award, really um, made me a, a filmmaker, as I said in the film. It really made, you know, it sewed up my commitment to this being a lifelong um, endeavor. Mm -hmm. And, well, in general, apart from, from winning the Teddy Award, what would you say is the significance of the Teddy Award in the U.S.? Does it have a significance there? 
interesting that you say that. I think that the the concept of a bear as an award um, <laughs> for a film uh, is one that Americans didn't know. <laughs> you know, they think of the Oscar, you know, a standing nude body. Um, but in the realm of filmmaking, independent filmmaking, in the last, I would say, maybe about 10 years. Because there is that Sundance thing, right? So people understanding what the significance of sort of speaking an international queer language in filmmaking and that the Teddy is the pinnacle of it. I mean, I think it is the first, you know, major award to go to filmmakers, um, which I'm like so shocked at. I, I know that the, the Cannes Foundation is trying to do that with, uh, with their festival, but it's the first. Um, and uh, I... I, I it's 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 a wonderful thing. It's still a wonderful thing. It's still a thing that I hope to you know get you know uh, achieve uh, as a, a two time person. You know, trying to be up there. I think the owls almost made it. Um, and uh, it's it's just a an amazing thing. And it's amazing to see how the Teddy has become this global thing and has become part of a global aspiration for not only American queer filmmakers but internationally. So uh, it's it's a wonderful thing. It's it's be, it's beyond the bear to you know bearing other things. Well, next year the Teddy Award is going to celebrate its 30th birthday, and um, well, what would you like to wish the Teddy Award as a birthday wish? Looking back at the last 30 years, what would you wish it for for the next years? Right. What do I wish for the Teddy? Um, I wish that the Teddy would uh, maybe grace a um, uh, embrace a concept of uh, what's going on in other forms of media, in the sense that there is sort of uh, internet media productions that are, you know, very vital that are happening right now um, globally, um, and so I think it breaks down the bar. So it'll be interesting to see if the Teddy maybe can figure out. Away. And that's a hard, hard one to do, but how can we sort of, um, as an activist thing and as a, a thing of empowerment, you know, reach the sort of television or internet makers who are queer and, and coming with these new modes of production, people on YouTube, people on, you know, all these other places globally who are expressing themselves and, and making magical work, maybe the, the Teddy will see another category for that, 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 those modes of production and not just work that shows in um, the film festival. Maybe there's another way that we can um, incorporate another award within the, the Teddy's awards.